inter method using a multi sample holder to characterize from what the iron and cobalt is the crops in the scatteries. The authors are Gary Jacobs, Amitava Sarkar, Yayin Z, Bert Davis, Donald Kunauer, Jeremy Kropp, and Christopher Marshall. Contribution comes from the Center of Applied Energy Research and Argon. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk about a, um, a novel TPR XAP Zanes method. What makes it novel is this multi sample holder. Uh, at, at Oregon, they've developed a way to basically test six catalysts at a time, and they asked us to send catalysts. So these are the, going to be some of the results. Of course, Burke uh, covered the motivation in, uh, in his talk, but essentially there's been renewed interest in. A cobalt catalyst, um, mainly for converting uh, natural gas derived syn gas to uh, liquid fuels. And a number of uh, uh, positive points there about cobalt catalysts. And just to point out here, SASOL uses a, uh, a capable cobalt alumina catalyst in their slurry phase processes, but it's heavily loaded with cobalt 30 grams of cobalt to 100 grams of aluminum. There's also been renewed interest in iron phase catalysts. Uh, especially in the states, uh, for possible uh, possible use in cold to liquids, and uh, iron catalysts are used in high temperature fissure tropes, but they're also being used uh, or being looked <coughs> into for uh, converting uh, cold drive syn gas to a low hydrogen to CO ratio, basically because they have they possess intrinsic water gas shift activity can be used to adjust the hydrogen to CO ratio upward. To give an outline, um, for cobalt catalysts, we'll look at primary factors influencing active site densities, including support choice, loading, and promoters. This trade off between cluster size and catalyst reducibility, which is governed by the support. Briefly touch on some stability issues there. And for iron catalysts, we'll look at how copper and alkali dopants um, help to activate catalysts. About 10 years ago, Iglesia published. Uh, this, uh, these graphs here, which basically shows you over a wide range of catalysts, basically you have the same turnover frequency, uh, meaning that uh, the active sites are essentially the cobalt metallic atoms. And so uh, as a function of uh, dispersion, you get this linear trend uh, for conversion. The scope of my talk will cover catalysts prepared by standard uh, aqueous impregnation methods. And then we add promoters basically before a one-step calcination process. At our center, we, we first look <coughs> at using a TPR, standard TPR. And we always see these two peaks here, one at low temperature, one at higher temperature. It's been proposed that this is maybe due to a two-step reduction process where CO304 goes to COO, and then in the second step, COO goes to the metal. And the second step consumes three times as much hydrogen as the first, and you can see the second peak is usually about three times bigger. And the first step occurs about the same temperature, but the second step depends heavily on the support. And you can see here, for, we have weakly interacting cobalt silica. Reduction is pretty easy, but for cobalt catalysts, some of these, you need to go up to about 700 degrees before you get all the cobalt reduced. So we use a standard 10-hour uh, reduction in hydrogen at 350. And you can see when we carry out TPR after reduction, there's still quite a lot of cobalt oxide species that remain unreduced. Actually, there have been several proposed explanations for the broad peak in TPR. And while we favored this one, where the second step basically uh, depends, is influenced by the support interaction, others have proposed uh, different theories. For example, in one theory, uh, it's proposed that uh, larger cobalt crystallite, cobalt oxide crystallites reduce in the first peak, and then you have reduction of ions in the second peak. Or in case three here, you have reduction again of the larger crystallites in the first peak, and you have a mixed oxide of uh, cobalt oxide with aluminum. So we looked at using uh, synchrotron techniques, with help from uh, Argon and Brookhaven. And uh, just to briefly highlight the uh, Zanes and excess phenomena, uh, basically photons are sent to the sample and are absorbed by a central atom. This dislodges an electron from the core of the atom, and at low kinetic energies, 
the electron probes uh, uh, empty available states above the Fermi level, and that gives electronic information about oxidation states. And with XFs, this occurs when the electron has high enough kinetic energy that's outside of the atom, goes out as a wave and a particle. Essentially, the outgoing wave is backscattered by the nearest neighbors. There's an interference that takes place, and the interferences are modulated by this function of energy. And you can analyze those oscillations in the spectra to determine who's around your absorbing atom and how many. General electronic description of this. This is the Zanes region. This is XFs here. And again, in Zanes, we're ejecting the electron to empty available states above the Fermi level. Uh, or XFs has enough significant kinetic energy that it's outside of the atom interacting with the neighbors. So these are the first Zanes. These are reference compounds here. You can see for oxidized cobalt compounds, you have this high intensity feature, which is called the white line. Essentially, oxygen is removing electrons from the valence band of the metal, freeing up available states above the Fermi level. So the probability for scattering goes up because you have more parking places for the electron. And this is the reduced. You can see it has very low white line. So here are the TPR uh, uh, Zanes spectra. And uh, essentially, we start off with CO304. And as we increase temperature here, you can clearly see that CO304 is reduced to COO before the metal uh, is reduced to the metal. That's with 15% cobalt alumina. And then with hot, more heavy loading, uh, the uh, process is facilitated slightly to lower temperatures. Okay. This is, they call this a six shooter because they can load six catalysts. So this is catalyst three here. Here we've added a little bit of platinum. You can see both steps are facilitated. We still have the transitions there. And then the more heavily loaded catalyst is facilitated further. For uh, cobalt silica, where we have the weak interaction, and for CO304, COO is a very short-lived intermediate. And there's a reason for that, which we're going to get into. We basically can carry out the linear combination of Zanes fitting to quantify uh, which species are present and, and how much at each step. Looking at XS data, uh, basically if the, if the atom is isolated, you don't get the XS effect. You have to have neighbors uh, in order to get the backscattering. So for a free atom, you can see we don't have oscillations after the edge jump here. But when we do have atoms, like in a lattice, uh, after the edge jump, after electrons kicked out, you can see we have these uh, oscillations as a function of energy. Essentially, uh, at, at points here where the outgoing and backscattered waves interfere constructively, um, the probabil probability for scattering goes up. You have an increase in absorption and vice versa for when there's destructive interference, and that's what causes these, these modulations as a function of energy. So standard data reduction involves uh, background removal of the pre-edge and the post-edge, and then uh, normalization to the height of the edge jump. And you have to convert from energy space to photoelectron wave vector space related to momentum. And then finally, uh, you take the Fourier transform in order to get the radial distribution function, which uh, Jerry Huffman was talking about earlier. And you could see, uh, basically, we get information about who is around the atom, and by the intensity, how many atoms are around the atom of interest that you're looking at. So here we have TPR XS. Basically, it comes from the same spectra, just a different section of it. We start off with cobalt oxygen, cobalt cobalt coordination, and CO304. And then as a function of temperature, we have cobalt cobalt coordination and cobalt oxygen coordination in COO prior to the formation of the metal. This is cobalt cobalt coordination in the metal here. And then this is all six catalysts, slightly shortened K range here. But here's the cobalt alumina catalyst again, CO304 going to COO and then the formation of the metal. 25% cobalt alumina basically occurs at slightly lower temperatures. And by this intensity here, we see we have larger crystallites forming. And then with platinum, you can see that both steps are shifted to lower temperatures. Now for cobalt oxide and cobalt silica, 
again, COO is a very short-lived intermediate here. But look at the peak cobalt-cobalt coordination once the metal is formed. It's much larger for silica than it, than it is for aluminum, indicating that we have much larger particles for the cobalt-silica catalyst, despite the higher surface area of the silica. And when we cool down the catalyst after the TPR and we look at the excess, <coughs> you can clearly see the trend here. The ones with the smallest crystallites are the low-loaded cobalt alumina, and cobalt silica has the largest uh, degree of cobalt-cobalt coordination, meaning it <coughs> has the largest particle. Now, in-house at the CAR, we can carry out similar uh, studies, not XF studies, but we can get similar information by using uh, chem absorption techniques. So we use a uh, hydrogen TPD, pulse reoxidation method, where the TPD gives, uh, sweep gives um, the chem absorbed hydrogen, which tells us how many surface cobalt atoms we have. And then pulse reoxidation after the TPD allows us to quantify extent of reduction. And then we combine the two measurements in order to get a uh, cluster size estimate. So the, uh, in the dispersion equation, hydrogen TPD sweep goes in the numerator. The extent of reduction goes in the denominator. And then with geometrical arguments, we're able to arrive at the cluster size. And we assume a spherical morphology here. So from promoted cal calcine catalysts, Okay, the cobalt silica had the, was the easiest to reduce. It has the highest extent of reduction after the 350 treatment in hydrogen for 10 hours. But it has the lowest active site density because the cliff crystallite size is very large. So despite the lower uh, extent of reduction for cobalt alumina, cobalt titania, cobalt alumina is only 30%, you have a much higher active site density because the crystallite size is much smaller. So are there ways to improve cobalt alumina catalyst so we can take more, uh, make more effective usage of the cobalt? This slide just shows that, that uh, from, from those measurements, when you get below 10 nanometers, the, the catalyst becomes more difficult to reduce. And so we, uh, to try to improve uh, extended reduction, we went to higher loadings to try to break the support interaction or to use promoters like platinum. Both uh, work. This is moving from 15 to 25 percent. This is adding uh, platinum. You can see we're able to facilitate reduction. These are the uh, hydrogen TPD pulse reoxidation measurements. Now you can see cobalt aluminum, we add a little bit of platinum, we're able to double the extent of reduction, and maintain similar crystallite size, so that effectively doubles the active site content. For the more heavily loaded cobalt alumina catalyst, we did improve reduction from 30 to 42 percent. Crystallites are, are larger, and the active site count did go up slightly. In the reactor, under aging, this is um, 15 percent cobalt alumina. This is on a similar per gram catalyst basis. Space velocity five here. You see, we do double the extent of reduction, or the uh, we do double the uh, CO conversion rate by doubling the active site count. This is with a little bit of platinum. But now we're facilitating the reduction of species that are strongly interacting with the support. These catalysts actually deactivate quite rapidly. And since we're at high CO conversion, it also means we're at higher water partial pressures. And it's been proposed that uh, for cobalt alumina catalysts that, uh, that they're quite sensitive to the effect of water. When we move to higher loadings, the catalysts are more stable. And this is quite similar to uh, some of the loadings reported by SASOL. This is their 25% cobalt loading catalyst. So we wanted to explore sensitivity to water a little bit, and so we were looking at some kinetic studies uh, with, uh, with water. These are actually water coat feeding studies, and we're essentially replacing uh, inert balancing gas with increasing amounts of water. This is for the weakly interacting cobalt silica catalyst. There's actually a positive effect of water up to about 25%, followed by very strong deactivation. For the moderately interacting cobalt titanium catalyst, there's a uh, negligible to uh, slightly negative effect at some, some of these lower space velocities where we have higher conversion and higher water partial pressures. For cobalt alumina, there's actually a reversible negative effect. This is the low loaded platinum promoted catalyst up to about 25% followed by catastrophic deactivation at 20, above 25%. And you can see the 25% cobalt alumina catalyst is less sensitive to uh, the effect of water. There's a reversible effect even up to 
So we wanted to explore what was happening with the cobalt alumina catalysts um, by XFs and Zanes to see if, we're, if we could detect like cobalt support compound formation as has been reported in the literature. So we uh, took samples from the reactor and solidified them in the wax and took those to Brookhaven. And you can see uh, at 30% water, we do have a growth in this uh, feature in the Zanes derivative spectra, which matches pretty closely with cobalt aluminate. For the 25% cobalt aluminate catalyst, 25% uh, water addition, it appears that we're forming some COO there, but when we turn the water off, uh, the uh, metallic cobalt came back. In XFs, we saw uh, essentially no impact on cobalt-cobalt coordination up to 15%, but at 30%, we see a loss in cobalt-cobalt coordination and an increase in cobalt-oxygen coordination. When we turn the water off, this is the low-loaded platinum-promoted catalyst. The catalyst did not recover. This is for the 25% cobalt aluminum catalyst. 25% water, we do see some loss in cobalt-cobalt coordination, but when we turn the water off, the catalyst recovered. Slightly larger indicating cluster size did increase from the oxidation reduction cycle. And for the low-loaded platinum-promoted catalyst, well, we do hit that 28%, but catastrophic deactivation, we did see a jump in CO2 selectivity. And uh, cobalt catalysts have low intrinsic water gas shift activity. So um, it suggests that we have formed something other than metallic cobalt there. And a cobalt support compound is a good candidate. So uh, to conclude on the cobalt part, uh, TPR, Zanes, XS is a very powerful tool for determining how uh, the catalysts reduce. We can scan several catalysts at a time now. Um, addition of noble metal can facilitate reduction of species interacting with the support. Those species, however, if the crystallite size is very small, are quite sensitive to uh, affecting water. And more robust catalysts can be uh, uh, formulated at higher loadings. Moving on to uh, iron catalysts, we just wanted to know, do promoters like copper and alkali influence carburization rates during activation in CO? We're using 5% CO here. So we look, we're using uh, testing uh, five catalysts. And just very quickly, this one is undoped. This is Zanes here. We start with Fe203, we're going to Fe304. And there's very little reduction after four hours at 270. And in XFs, you can see basically we still have iron oxygen and iron iron coordination in the oxide. When we put a little bit of potassium, however, we see we have the same Fe203, Fe304, but after four hours, we have much greater reduction, extent of reduction, and you can see the peak forming for iron-iron coordination in the carbide. And there's a drop in iron-iron and iron-oxygen coordination in the oxide. And this effect is exacerbated when we add uh, more potassium and we add copper. Now you can see the peaks are shifted to lower temperature and we have a greater extent of reduction in zanes. And we have great loss in iron-iron coordination, iron-oxygen coordination in the oxide and a much greater uh, formation of iron-iron in the carbide. We can select the spectra for Fe203 and maximum Fe304 content along the tra trajectory for all of these different catalysts that we tested. And then after four hours reduction, you can see with increasing promoter content, the white line is decreasing. We have increasing uh, uh, extent of reduction there. That's after four hours at 270 and 5% CO. Likewise, we can pull out spectra for maximum Fe203, Fe304 content along the trajectory of the TPR XFs. And then after four hours at 270, we're seeing, as we increase promoter content, we're seeing increase in the iron-iron coordination in the carbide. We can actually quantify using a Zanes linear combination fit of FE304 and iron foil uh, for the spectra after the 270 treatment. And for XFs, we're using a, a semi-quantitative uh, method. It's a subtraction technique developed by Iglesia and coworkers to subtract out the contribution of the uh, Fe304 from the spectra and leave you with the, with the carbide here. And so uh, for Zanes, you can see as we, uh, as we <coughs> increase promoter content, we're increasing the extent of reduction after the uh, treatment at 270. And we also have increasing, this is an XS, increasing iron-iron coordination in the carbide, which is consistent with the Zanes. And we've done theoretical XS modeling 
on these different carbide structures, cementite, epsilon carbide, and head carbide, uh, which Professor Ozkan talked about earlier. And uh, these are the theoretical structures. You can see by comparing the, the uh, carbide here from XFs that ones that really uh, are closest are either the epsilon carbide or head carbide, but we can pretty much rule out cementite. So in conclusion, just want to uh, conclude here that for the iron catalyst, the copper and potassium promoters do facilitate carburization rates. For unpromoted catalysts, uh, it's been found that in Dr. Davis's group that iron catalysts do tend to deactivate by iron oxide formation, and so it's important to balance uh, the oxidation with uh, carburization rates, and one way to improve carburization rates is to use these promoters like potassium and copper. And that basically just shows the, the power of this, uh, this new TPR XF Zane